<laughs> Since the beginning of cinema, one character has been particularly popular among filmmakers and the audience. Dracula. The vampire created by Bram Stoker in 1897. The year of release of the popular book was very close to the beginnings of cinema. Throughout the 20th century, a number of film adaptations have been created portraying Dracula. In 1992, Francis Ford Coppola finished his version, which is not only an adaptation, it's also a tribute to 100 years of cinema and traditional filmmaking techniques. Why is this movie so special? And how did Coppola create an extravaganza of practical special effects? Let's have a look. Francis Ford Coppola created a grand spectacle, full of lavish costumes, beautiful sets, great actors like Gary Oldman, Anthony Hopkins, Keanu Reeves or Winona Ryder. Unforgettable music composed by Wojciech Kilar that became a blueprint for horror music in next years. And of course, special effects, without which a fantasy story about a vampire could not exist. However, Coppola's approach to special effects was unusual. In time when green screens and computer effects were becoming a must-have for every self-respecting director and a trendy thing that a successful movie needs, he decided to use only traditional techniques and make almost everything in camera. And this wasn't a decision forced by budget limitations. It was a deliberate decision, a journey back in time to the beginnings of cinema and the story of Dracula, and a tribute to all the ingenious filmmakers that developed the in-camera special effects. What does it mean that the effects are created in camera? It means that the image photographed by the camera is final, no post-production needed. I thought that I would not only make the film uh, entirely in, in a false place, in a studio, but I would only use effects done as they would have been done in 1900. Though the visual effects supervisors hired for the movie haven't been that much enthusiastic about the idea to explore the analog and in-camera techniques. I have not been getting what I've been asking for. I have been asking for shadows and illusion and double, uh, double, double impositions and, and um, imagination. And the big visual effects supervisors came on the film and told me how I had to do this stuff. And basically I saw that little by little they were, as they always do, leading me down the path to do it the way everybody else does it. I fired them and I hired my young son, I don't know that he was even 30 at the time, uh, uh, Roman Coppola, uh, to be my, my collaborator. So, together with his son, Francis Ford Coppola could finally realize his vision. And the exploration of old film techniques wasn't just about special effects. The first big decision was to make the whole movie in a studio, on a huge soundstage and at studio's backlot, just like it would often happen during the so-called golden age of cinema. Action! This gave him a total control over the environment, where the style and mood of the film could be precisely sculpted. Thanks to the perfect work of set designers and many craftsmen, you can't tell that it's a fake environment. Of 
course, even the biggest soundstage is a limited space. So to present exterior shots, you need some kind of special effects. In this case, a traditional glass matte paintings were used to extend the sets built in studio. Beautiful and terrifying, paintings of Transylvania have been created by a veteran matte painting company, Matte World. The huge realistic sets were filmed with matte paintings placed in front of the camera covering only specified areas of the glass, resulting in a perfect blend. With proper preparation, camera panning was also possible. That technique has been extensively used since very early movies. With the development of computers, it was replaced with digital matte painting. Many shots were possible to create only with use of miniatures, delivering spectacular results. Like in this shot, where a hanging miniature of a mansion adds an illusion of distance and depth to a small movie set. The mansion is actually hanging in the air with an arm, so the mansion is suspended. And then there's, and then there's the, the ground that slopes down, and it, if you bring it really close to the camera, then it appears like it's 250 yards away, even though it's a miniature. And then you can have the full-scale fence, the full-scale horses, and the carriage. In front of all of this, you can make it appear as if it's a, it's a mansion sitting there, 250 yards away. As the one-eyed camera captures the world as a 2D image, the distance between elements disappears. Usually, foreground miniatures have been used to extend buildings by suspending the miniature in front of the camera and aligning it to seamlessly blend with the set. The advantage of hanging miniature over a matte painting is that you can change the lighting on set and it will affect the miniature as well. The whole effect was achieved on set, no post-production required. Another great example of miniature shot and in-camera effects was this travel sequence, supervised by Gene Warren Jr., who created special effects for some of the greatest Hollywood movies. I think we had to deliver 22 seconds worth in order, to, which is long for this type of uh, situation, particularly for a c traveling right to left. It also involved a, a very small scale miniature of the train. We had a mountain range that was fixed, but the sky was only three feet behind it. And in front of that, rocks and some smaller trees that moved at a very slow rate. And then there was a, a middle ground that moved a little faster. And then the immediate foreground outside the train car moved very fast. The camera was on another track right in front of it that moved from left to right. And the set in front of us was moving from right to left. And that gave us the, the speed distance. And it was a two-pass shot, so in the film it's not sent to the lab to be developed. We had to back it up, turn all the lights out, and that there was a, like a movie screen, and then we projected on that sky a plate of Dracula's eyes that Roman had shot. There was a mock-up of the interior of the train car on tires or springs that Keanu sat in. And behind it, again, is a like a movie screen, but it's known as a rear projection screen because you're projecting the image from behind rather than in front. When you see that in the, in the theater, what you're seeing there all was done together. The background and the foreground was done together. My friend. 
Welcome to the cafe. I am anxiously expecting you. It was a, a big challenge, and I love doing these uh, these other type techniques that every year goes by now, less and less are done, and I'm a hands-on kind of guy, and it's just much more fun than, you know, holding a mouse or... It... Part of this sequence was a close-up shot of a diary with a train in the background, which casts shadow on the book's page. It was also made possible thanks to miniatures. See, say this is the camera, and the train was about 20 feet away from us. And then the book was put literally, because it was a small book, it was a real journal, the book was put literally right next to the lens. To be able to get the shadow onto a little book like this wasn't going to work. So Gene, my father, decided, well, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to recreate the book 20 feet away. And then use the same train, put one light up, make a shadow of the smoke, and make it go across the book. And I'm sitting here going, well, that's going to have to be like a 20-foot wide book. And Gene says, well, okay. Coppola used a whole range of camera tricks to cleverly achieve many effects. Campbell. Reverse playback is one of them. Here, it was used to light the candles in a magical way. And in this shot, to create supernatural body movement. Playing with camera angles, together with well-prepared set, can help to break the laws of physics, or at least to make the audience believe it. Altering gravity, taking the camera, putting it on its side, putting the set a bit on its side, and then uh, unusual things happen in which you feel that you are level, but in fact you're not, and so the odd things happen. Ah, good. The marker. <laughs> to avoid digital compositing, as well as optical printing, double exposure was used. Filming an element while covering the rest of the frame, and then rewinding the film and shooting again to fill the unexposed part of the film. That was done in camera with two passes in which we photographed the rat with the camera upside down and we used a special matte box that blocked the film from being exposed. We rewound the film, flipped the camera over and aligned this special matte box that we had and then we were ready for uh, Keanu Reeves to come in and do his walking by with the candles and those two passes were exposed with one another. That technique allows to merge images without any post-production. Dracula is a character of many faces and forms, although played by the same actor. We have here the young knight Dracula, young romantic Dracula, old Dracula, old demonic Dracula, young wolf and Dracula, and a demonic bat creature. To create all those characters, without the use of computers, prosthetic makeup was applied. For decades, that was the way of creating fantastic creatures and characters. It requires a team of sculptors and makeup artists. Throughout the 20th century, these artists have brought the technique to perfection. For Dracula, the special effects makeup was created and applied to the actors by Greg Cannon. For that, he received one of his four Oscars. Recently, however, prosthetic makeup is being replaced with computer-generated characters, even though in many cases the results are a lot less believable than this practical effect. Dracula's director wanted to pay his respects to cinema history and its creators in one more way. 
An old Pathy camera from the cinema's silent era was used for this. Although loaded with a color film, it allowed to create this retro-looking scene and bring us closer to the era. Astounding. There are no limits to science. Actually, in one of the scenes, the characters are watching and discussing a presentation of one of the first real films ever made. A great way to pay a tribute and bind the story of Dracula with the beginnings of cinema. While the effects in Dracula were certainly jaw-dropping, it's even more impressive that almost all of them were done practically. With few exceptions, like the blue flames that can be seen outside of Count Dracula's castle, which required some form of compositing. Bram Stoker's Dracula is a great adaptation of the original book and a wonderful movie. But it has to be seen as something much more, considering the effort to preserve and study old filmmaking techniques. It was probably one of the last, if not the last movie, to use some of those techniques before the digital era has come and dominated filmmaking process. I can only recommend watching it. Thank you for watching. Please share your comments about those practical effects below and subscribe for more videos about VFX and its history.